Good evening. Thank you. Welcome to the 14th Annual Sconset History Night. My name is Hannah Judy, and I will be presenting You've Got Mail, a history of the Sconset Post Office. My son, Jamie Gretz, will also speak, and Rob Benchley is our photo editor. We are honored to have with us past and soon to be arriving current postal personnel. We've got Jim Ozius, Georgia Fowler in the front, and then Juliana will be joining us after she gets done dealing with today's mail. <laughs> we also have some past and current sconceters who will offer some remembrances and stories about the post office, and we'll hear from all of them later in the presentation. So while people are still coming in and getting settled, I'll do our thanks. I'd first like to thank the Sconset Casino and Dave Dunn for hosting and advertising this evening. Gratitude to On the Isle for providing refreshments, which I think are practically gone at this point. You had to get here early. Thanks to Egan Maritime for the loan of a projector, and to Mary and Al Novissimo of no Noviation, Novation, excuse me, Media for technical help. Thanks to Mark and Nantucket Community TV for taping this evening's presentation. Thanks to the Nantucket Historical Association, Peggy Godwin for research, and Ashley Miller for images. We thank the NHA for being the chief repository of Sconset history in many forms. A shout out to the Nantucket Preservation Trust for all they do to research and document Sconset history. Appreciation to the Sconset Trust for putting this evening on their calendar, but more importantly, for preservation of land and lighthouse and houses, and for their ongoing project of Sconset House Profiles. Thanks to Bob Felch for help with this year's flyer, research, and for, and for many years of masterminding and presenting at these evenings. Our postal princess has arrived. Although, frankly, we're debating calling her the queen of correspondence, but perhaps after she's officially married, not the rumors that have been running rampant around the village. Sconset History Night is an outgrowth of Sconset History Research Group founded by my father, Paul Judy, in 2008. My dad tells me that the genesis for the idea of the current group came from an old newspaper clipping he came across. Accompanied by a photo of a small group of sconceters, the article described a group headed by Clem Penrose with the stated mission of fostering and sharing research into the history of Sconset. Bob Felch took over from the group and this annual history night from my dad in 2015. Bob had planned to do this year's presentation on commerce in the Rotary, but found himself overwhelmed by life and three weeks three weeks ago had to beg off. Instead of canceling the evening, I decided to step in in honor of my father's, my 92-year-old father's legacy. And so I ask for your compassion and kindness. This is new territory for me, and I have done what I could in the midst of my own busy summer. That said, I have to tell you that after years, decades, of listening to my father go on and on about Sconset history, I have to agree that it is a pretty fascinating subject. Like many of you, I've had Sconset history books neatly lined up on my bookshelves. But this event has prompted me to finally read into them, and I urge all of you to do the same. I also want to acknowledge the treasure trove that is the digitized Inquirer and Mirror that you can easily access courtesy of the Athenaeum. Finally, before we turn to the subject at hand, a plea for help. I've left a pad of paper and a pen on the table next to the depleted snack table. If you are interested in Sconset history and getting involved in Sconset History Night, please put your contact information on that pad. Clearly, we need reinforcements if these evenings are to continue. You could also write down any topic suggestions you might have. So, I have chosen as my last minute topic for this evening the history of the Sconset Post Office. Why? 
because we have just passed the 150th anniversary of the founding of the post office here in Sconset. The Inquirer and Mirror reported in 1872, a post office has been established at Syasconset and Miss Love Baxter appointed postmistress. But let's go back further in Sconset history for a moment. How did Sconseters receive their mail prior to the founding of the actual post office? I'd like Rob to show you a short video now. It was made in 1976 in conjunction with our bicentennial. Constantly trying. That's Captain Baxter and the fish horn. He is arriving with the mail from, Nan from Nantucket. And you pay a penny and you get your letter. And he came, he came every day. Is that real mail? Well, no, he's just pretending. Okay. <laughs> just pretending. We'll get it, Captain Baxter, in a minute. Uh, Maybe if you'll come Reg, over here. It's Reg, is, is it Reg ba Bagnier? Reg Begonia. Begonia. Um, Mr. Begonia. Well, Margaret, could you tell us a little bit how, how difficult was it to obtain costumes for this day? It was very, very... Okay. Hey, may I have my letter if I have a penny? Here's my penny. Mail from town. Here's my penny. <laughs> Mrs. 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 Jeremiah Coffin. Fine. Thank you, sir. <laughs> are you Captain Baxter? Yes. You are. Yes. Can you tell us about your duties as post? Are you postmaster for the town? We are. We are uh, have a very efficient postal service here in Wisconsin. Uh, you know, I think about the days of 1976, and I wonder whether the postal service will be as good. Well, could you tell us a little bit about your postal service right now? Well, our postal service consists of a horse and a carriage, and we go into town every day. This is and, via Pulpus Road? No, the straight road, the right straight, straight road. into town, and we bring out the mail, and we deliver it directly to the folks. I'm going to pay you a penny yeah. and say that I am Phoebe Swain, and I would like my mail. Mrs. Phoebe Swain, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, oh, we have some more. Macy. Oh, Mrs. Macy. Oh, isn't that splendid? Mrs. Macy, where do you live? Mrs. Macy. I live on Clifton Avenue. Clifton Avenue? Yes. And did you mail, are you expecting some mail from yes, overseas? Is this from your husband in the whaling? Important. Very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rob. So, um, that is an imaginative reenactment of mail delivery in Sconset prior to 1872. The actors featured Reginald Bragonier, whose name will pop up again later in this talk, plays Captain Baxter, and Margaret Fawcett Barnes was Mrs. Jeremiah Coffin. Margaret Fawcett Barnes was a child of the actors' colony. She brought local theater to Nantucket and was a lifelong summer resident of Rosemary on Main Street. Clearly, Margaret, at age 78-ish, was just the person to memorialize theatrically mail delivery in pre-post pre office Sconset. Now, some quick history of the US postal system itself. There is a Nantucket connection, even in the founding of it. Benjamin Franklin was appointed first postmaster general by the Continental Congress in 1775. Although Benjamin Franklin was born in Boston, he was the son of Nantucket native Abiah Folger Franklin. Postage stamps were issued starting in 1847. Until 1863, those stamps only paid for the delivery of mail from one post office to another post office. Citizens picked up their mail, although in some cities and island villages as well, evidently, they could pay an extra one or two cent fee for letter delivery. On the United States Postal Service website, you can enter our beloved zip code into Postmaster Finder, and up pops a list of all postmasters for 02564. Rob has that up on the screen for you now. And there, at the top of that list, is Miss Love Baxter, appointed October 28, 1872. This from the USPS website. Women served as postmasters in the United States more than a century before they won the right to vote. Over the course of the 1800s, the number of women postmasters increased from fewer than a dozen to more than 6,000. Although popularly called postmistresses, their official title 
has always been postmaster. Following the Civil War, women were appointed as postmasters in greater numbers. Why? In a letter from March 1873, a mere five months after the founding of our post office, President Ulysses S. Grant, explaining why he had appointed a woman postmaster at Ashtabula, Ohio, stated, it is a class of appointments I am glad to make where it can be done. That is, giving a soldier's widow an opportunity of supporting herself and orphan children. Love Baxter was not a war widow, but had been helping her father, Captain William Baxter, sort the mail for years at Shenanga, the unofficial and then official post office. This from the NHA website, Digital Exhibit 02564. Shenanga, located at 10 Broadway, was one of the oldest fish houses in the village, supposedly moved from the ancient whaling station, Sasakacha. It had been a well-known public house and shop run by Betsy Carey in the mid-19th century. It became the summer home of Captain William Baxter and his wife, Betsy Carey Jr., after Mother Carey's death in 1862. In the winter, Betsy and William Baxter lived at 117 Main Street, a mansion built by, Barry, built by Betsy's grandfather, Edward Carey, and sold by him to William's father, Reuben Baxter. Shenanga got its name when the quarter board of the ship Shenanga wrecked off Tom Nevers on its way to Boston, loaded with cotton in 1852, was nailed above the door. When Captain Baxter retired from the sea after a voyage as master of the whale ship Martha in the late 1840s, he became a fisherman. And when the tourist industry began to grow, he established a stagecoach line between town and Sconset that coupled transportation with entertainment. Preposterous sea stories, playful misinformation, and a bumpy ride. His carriage was nicknamed the Lightning Express. Crowds of summer folk alerted by the tooting of Baxter's horn as the coach came over the top of Main Street gathered at Shenanga to collect their mail. Quaint Shenanga, with its famous figurehead on the lawn, served as the village post office until 1883. Going back to our list of postmasters, you will note that the Saisconset post office was discontinued on March 30th, 1874, a mere 17 months after it was first established. Moreover, it was not reestablished for over nine years until July 12th, 1883. I emailed the historian of the US Postal Service with numerous questions for this presentation, starting with Love Baxter and the mystery of that nine year hiatus. Steve Kokersberger, senior research analyst in postal history, replied with both a lovely photo of Love Baxter, there she is, but also with the following text. He said, I could find no specific reason why the office was discontinued in 1874. Usually this happened when there was no one qualified or willing to serve as postmaster. In 1876, Miss Baxter married an engineer named Albion Bucknew. She was 40 years old and it was her first marriage. If the office hadn't been discontinued, she would have been forced to resign as postmaster. Only unmarried women and widows could serve as postmasters. That's a crazy sentence, isn't it? Married women were ineligible. That rule was loosened over time. According to the 1880 census, Love Baxter Bucknew and her husband were living in Nantucket next door to her parents. Steve thinks, I suspect that Miss Baxter moved back with her parents in 1874, which led her to resign. The official register of the United States for 1873 shows that she earned just $12 as postmaster that year. Most post offices were located within a store or another business, as was true with Shenanga. Most pastor, postmasters were not salaried, but were paid a commission on their postal revenue. It seems quite likely that she was unable to earn enough income to support herself in Syasconset and moved back with her parents in Nantucket. 
He said finally, the office was reestablished in 1883. The name of Edward Baxter appears in the appointment record as postmaster, July 12, 1883, but for unknown reasons, he either declined the appointment or did not qualify. Despite that information and speculation from our postal historian, the mystery of that nine-year hiatus continued to bother me. So I decided to search the digitized Inquirer and Mirror. I quickly turned up one article from which I will now read. It was printed in the Inquirer and Mirror on Saturday, September 8, 1883, from an occasional correspondent the headline, The Evolution of a Post Office. Monsieur Editors, Syasconset is now a post village with all the paraphernalia and dignity that appertains thereto. It has required nearly a century and a half to bring about the results. 20 years ago, when Captain William Baxter was accustomed to drive back and forth to and from the bank during the fishing season, though he neither fished nor cut bait, he was accessory both before and after the fact by giving aid and comfort to those who did, by doing errands and carrying the letters and papers for the toilers of the sea. His labors in this regard were for some time gratuitously given. Now and then a passenger would be carried and for which he received the sum of 25 cents. He didn't get rich at it. At last, the inner consciences of the fishermen were illuminated with the idea that the captain was a necessity for their convenience. And later he was accorded a small compensation for the errands he did and for the letters and papers he brought and carried. In the course of time, Sconset became a summer resort, a cottage here and there being taken by off-islanders for the season. And the number of visitors grew until at last there was a necessity for the receipt and delivery of mail matter for a place. The captain's house became a depot for post delivery, in front of which the statue of Martha pointed to the door, and later, in clear violation of the statute in such cases made and provided, the words post office were nailed above the portal. During the height of the season, the captain, well advanced in years, but still as elastic in spirits as in his youth, went over his route, oftener twice a day than once, carrying the mail in a patent carpet bag, the like of which was never seen in the heavens, nor on the earth, nor in the waters beneath the earth. And man could have bowed down and worshiped it without violating any injunction of the scriptures. It was secured by a combination lock of manila twine the secret of opening and locking which was known only to Postmaster Murphy, Captain Baxter, and Mrs. Baxter. And they never divulged it until three years since, when the necessities of the mail traffic compelled them to let Mr. Henry R. Tucker of Boston into it. And they have never had occasion to regret the confidence they reposed in him. Since then, during nearly the entire season, Mr. Tucker has been a volunteer aide. That's an idea. Receiving and delivering the massive mail matter coming through the office. And he has also acted as cashier in collecting local postage between Syasconset and town, in which violation of the United States post office laws, Mrs. Baxter has been at a better, and the captain no better. But as everybody was glad that somebody was bold enough to defy the law for the public convenience, neither Tucker nor Mrs. Baxter nor the captain has been indicted. Then too, Mr. Tucker also took the contract for unraveling the intricacies of Captain Baxter's accounts as express messenger and common carrier to which position he had elected himself as everybody's friend. The accounts were kept in a unique manner, peculiar to the captain. It was a combination of single entry in his head, double entry on a scrap of paper lying loose in his pocket, and oftener no entry at all. And between the three, it was difficult to tell whether the captain was rushing into the vortex of bankruptcy 
or was amassing thousands of dollars each season. I love this. But several years ago, the village had a premonitory symptom of what was to happen. A post office was actually established, and Miss Love Baxter, the daughter of Captain Baxter, was appointed postmaster. Yes, postmaster. For there is no such office known to the law as postmistress. At a salary of $12 a year, and to Captain Baxter was awarded the contract of carrying the mail, for which he was to be paid by the government of the United States, the munificent fund sum of $8 for every year's service. The result was that the postmaster found she was getting rich too fast. And as for the mail contractor, he was afraid he would be tempted to rush into Wall Street and speculate in stocks out of his profits. <laughs> and bethinking himself of the scriptural statement that it was as easy for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle as for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, he suddenly became sick at his stomach and threw up his contract. As for the postmaster, she stopped short in her mad career of making money in office, retired into private life, and got married. Again, things went on in just the old way until this year, so that's the nine-year hiatus. When the island was visited by Assistant Postmaster General Elmer, whose official eye, at a glance, took in the situation, and at once a movement was made to get somebody to take the place. None here were born great, nor had they acquired greatness, and they were averse to having greatness thrust upon them. It was the hardest task ever undertaken on the bank to hatch out a postmaster. Men and women were entreated and implored to accept the honor, but all declined. At last, the batteries of argument and persuasion were brought to bear upon Mrs. Almy. After a prayerful night of solemn introspection, she concluded that she would accept the trust. And now the head of her name and the tail are identical in official correspondence, for she signs herself P.M. Almy, P.M. In other words, Priscilla M. Almy, Postmaster. So Captain Baxter was given the contract as courier at an even better compensation than he was accorded before, on the promise that he would bear his honors meekly and draw his salary without flinching. On the first day of September, the new order of things went into effect. The machine works well and it gives universal satisfaction. Still, it is with some feeling of regret that we see the post office removed from the watchful care of that wooden virgin, Marcia, Martha, against whose character not a word was ever uttered, who in sunshine and in storm, under bright skies and clouds, stood in front of the old house where we have often met the captain and heard the truthful stories about a hundred things never could have been believed if told by anybody else. So that's the mystery. So. The article ends with the initials of the author, E-F-U. Edward F. Underhill is what I'm thinking. So Priscilla M. Almy was appointed on August 13, 1883, a month after the post office was reestablished. I'd like to read for you now a snippet from the New York graphic. It was reprinted in the inky. It has a specific section on the post office, but I'll read you a bit more than that. It's entitled, Summer Days at Sconset. Subtitle, Laziness, Luxury, Superstition, Old Whalers, Old Hulks, and Old Lighthouse Keepers. <laughs> Summer cottages are increasing at Syasconset. The occupation of permanent cottagers is sleeping, eating, bathing, sitting on the verandas, lolling on the beach, waiting for the mail, talking weather, staring at the newly arrived visitors, and wishing the season at an end so that they may return to the city and prove by tanned skins that they have been in the country. <laughs> the chief occupation of three-fifths of the dwellers for the summer at Syasconset is to sit or lie down. 
They sit by the hour on porch or hotel veranda. They transport their bodies to the beach and lie down. There's a lot more that you would love, but we're, that's all I can give you now. Mrs. Almy now keeps the Syasconset post office. Aforetime and for many years, Captain Baxter, aged 80 years, kept it. His was a self-appointed postmastership. He had no office but brought letters for the Syasconsetters from Nantucket and received from the natives and cottagers alike a centerpiece for so bringing them. When Captain Baxter blew his horn in front of a private residence, it announced the arrival of a letter. Captain Baxter is a well-preserved old whaling captain, a living landmark of the whaling days and possesses a fertile and imaginative mind. He drives a stage, has other stages driven for him, and enlivens his passengers during trips by ingeniously devised stories. He points out crows on the moors and announces them as newly arrived plover. He has shown a certain swamp pond to a stranger and declared that its waters were a sure cure for bunions. And the stranger had been seen furtively soaking his feet in that pond for hours. Almost six years after the post office reestablishment, the Enquirer and Mirror reported this in April 1889, new post office at Sconset. At the head of the bridge adjoining his Sconset store, Mr. John Harps is having erected a small two-story building, which will be the Sconset post office in future. The building is 17 by 20 and fronts upon the bridge. The north end will be set apart as the lobby, the southern portion being arranged for the office. In the upper story will be rooms for accommodation of Mrs. Almy, the postmistress. It will be a decided change for the better. Another small mystery, NHA 02564 says Shenunga served as the post office till 1883, but now we have it not moving to Elbow Lane until 1889. Priscilla Almy served for almost eight years. She was followed by Marie S. Platt, who served briefly in 1891. And by briefly, I mean four and a half months, one summer season. One wonders if even in 1891, those summers in Sconset were exhausting for our postal personnel. <laughs> Concerning the next, the next Sconset postmaster, Steve Kokersberger noted, Anne S. Chinnery was appointed in October 1891. When she was married in 1896, she was not compelled to resign, but she did have to be reappointed under her new name, Anne S. Brayton. This was likely because postmasters had to be bonded before they could serve. If a woman's surname changed, she would need a new bond under her new name. During Anne Brayton's last year of service, 1897, the Enquirer and Mirror reported in its Sconset notes, the post office opened up for the season Tuesday morning and its convenience is appreciated. On November 5, 1897, Miss Anna E.C. Barrett was appointed postmaster of Sconset. She would remain postmaster for almost 31 years. Miss Anna E.C. Barrett was born in Nantucket on March 26, 1863, the daughter of Josiah Fitch Barrett, Nantucket Sheriff. I have to digress for a moment and read to you from a charming piece in the December 30, 1916 issue of the Enquirer Mirror headlined, Sheriff Barrett Entertained. Nantucket's venerable sheriff, Josiah F. Barrett, who will be 89 years old next March, observed Christmas this year by entertaining the members of his family and his neighbors at his house on Liberty Street, where his daughter, Miss Anna E.C. Barrett, decorated a pretty Christmas tree and arranged for the entertainment of the sheriff's guests in a very pleasing manner. There was an appropriate gift on the tree for every person present, and it was a very merry Christmas party. Josiah F. Barrett was elected High Sheriff for Nantucket County in November 1877, and has continued to hold the position through each consecutive term, now being the oldest public official on Nantucket, both in years and terms of service. So the sheriff was 39 years in, in office at the time of that Christmas party. 
Early in Anna, Anna Barrett's tenure, the Inky noted, May 1899, it will be pleasant news to those sojourning in Sconset this season to learn that a money order department has been added to the post office. More importantly, in 1902, the post office was moved to a house belonging to Harriet E. Gardner, where it remains today. So our post office has been in that same spot and building since 1902. More on the building itself later. In 1907, Anna Barrett received two letters from Representative William S. Green of Fall River. They're now held in the research library of the NHA. I deciphered them as best I could, as follows. Dear Madam, your letter of the 22nd came duly to hand. I am very glad for your sake that the post office department have had the good sense to allow you to close the office in the winter. I wrote them as strong a letter as I could and will try in every way to befriend you. Kindly advise me above if anything new arises. <laughs> 11 days later, Representative Green of Fall River sent a second letter to Anna Barrett. Dear Madam, your letter came duly to hand. I have received some pro protests against the discontinuance of the post office, most notably from Mr. Isaac Halls and Henry Paddock, Esquire. Mr. Paddock was a former resident of Fall River, and I have known him for more than 45 years. He seems very urgent for the continuance of the post office during the entire year. I have written all the parties who have written me that the PO department did not see fit to consult me regarding their action, but I supposed it had been determined upon because of the small amount of business and large expense of maintenance of the office during the winter months. Very respectfully, William S. Green. So we know that the Sconset Post Office was seasonal at least in 1897 and 1907, but I couldn't find out more than that until Karen Coffin Quigley came across a listing of post hour office hours under Anna Barrett. And we're not going to see that slide, that's fine. There, there was very complicated hours, but it was clearly open all year. Very late, exactly, like 7 p.m., I forget. Senior research analyst in postal history, senior Steve Kokersberger, also related the following. In 1916, business at the Saisgonsa Post Office had increased to the point where the office advanced from a fourth class office to a third class office. This is an important distinction, as postmasters in offices of the first, second, and third classes were paid a salary unlike in the fourth class offices. Postmasters of these offices were appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. Thus, they were called presidential offices. Sure enough, the Inquirer and Mirror noted in its January 27, 1917 issue headline, Miss Barrett nominated. The Senate received from President Wilson on Wednesday, the nomination of Miss Anna E.C. Barrett to be postmaster at Syasconset. There is no doubt, but the nomination will be confirmed. Who knew we were so important? <laughs> A December 20 inky had an article entitled Postmasters at Sconset. Following the article in our last issue on the postmasters who have served in Nantucket, it may be of interest to refer briefly to the Sconset Post Office which has been doing business since 1872. There have been four postmasters, and all have been ladies. It goes on to list the ladies, leaving out Marie Platt. March 1924, the Inquirer and Mirror headlines, reappointed postmaster, President Coolidge on Wednesday nominated Anna E.C. Barrett to be postmaster at Syasconset. Miss Barrett has held the position for some time, but her term of office has expired and the department at first issued a call for an examination for applicants for the position. Soon after the announcement was made, it was withdrawn and a competitive examination was not held for some reason or another. The nomination now being handed to Miss Barrett without a contest of any kind. We do things our own way out here, evidently. And then four years later, March of 1928, the Inquirer and Mirror story headlined the Sconset Post Office. 
The announcement that Ms. Anna E.C. Barrett, who has held the position of postmaster at Sconset for many years, will not accept reappointment opens the way for an interesting contest among those who would like to secure the job, which is far more desirable from a monetary viewpoint than it was when Ms. Barrett was first appointed. The Sconset office does a large business during the summer months and it carries a good salary. Meanwhile, from at least 1911 to 1952, I found evidence of Anna Barrett's real estate career, much of it conducted out of her cottage, Sleepy Hollow, on Pochick Street. For instance, April 1913 issue of the Inquirer Mirror, listed under the heading Sconset Rentals. Miss Anna Barrett, real estate agent at Sconset, reports the following rentals for the season of 1913. There's a list of 22 rentals, which include Daisy Cot to Mrs. Calloway and family of Palisades, New Jersey, and then an entire section on cottages in the Underhill settlement have been rented as follows, which includes House Jack built to Dr. Clement Penrose of Baltimore, Maryland. One wonders how she conducted her real estate business alongside her postmaster business. Ms. Barrett seems to have summered in Sconset and wintered in Nantucket town. As many of you know, it was traditional for decades to announce your comings and goings in the paper. Hence, we see mentions like, Miss Anna Barrett returned to town on Tuesday from November 2nd, 1929, in Sconset, Sconset Notes. And under Personals on May 4th, 1946, Miss Anna E.C. Barrett is at her home in Sconset. In the longstanding tradition of Nantucketers, it also appears that when Miss Barrett left town, she rented out her town lodging. June 25th, 1927, the Inquirer and Mirror says, Miss Gladys Wood Real Estate Agency reports the following rentals for the summer season. Miss Anna Barrett's second floor apartment, 17 Cliff Road, to Charles Chapin of Springfield, Mass. Anna Barrett was succeeded by another long-tenured postmaster, Philip Morris. In a moment, my son, Jamie Gretz, will tell you about Philip Morris. Jamie was a history major, I was an English major, and does work at the NHA, although he is here tonight not in any official capacity but as a regular sconsitor. But first, a snippet about modern contrivances arriving at the village post office just at the changing of the postmaster guard from Anna Barrett to Philip Morris. From the July 14, 1928 Inquirer and Mirror, Business at the Sconset Post Office has been conducted in shade and darkness for so many years, we are now wondering how the business was ever done. How many patrons fumbled around for their P.O. boxes, and how many times they have tried two or three locks before finding their own mailbox in the smoky darkness. Navigating a boat in pea soup fog was nothing compared to the effort of landing one's key in the right box. And now the lobby is lighted with electricity to the satisfaction of postmaster and patrons. Good night and good riddance, old smoking lamp, and may you never darken our office again. <laughs> also, it should be noted that Marie Platt's daughter not only corrects Philip Morris's list of Sconset postmasters, postmistresses in her letter to the editor, but also wonders if Philip Morris realizes he broke the long line of petticoat postmistresses. So Jamie, if you would talk to us about Philip Morris, and then we're going to have some people with stories about Philip Morris, I hope. Good evening. I would just like to preface that the vast majority of the information for this section has been taken from two articles written by the late John Lathrop in Historic Nantucket, uh, to whom much credit is due. Now, Philip Morris uh, would be born in Sconset in 1899 and would live to see this village change drastically over his life and his near 35 career. 35 year career as postmaster and uh, one of the major ways being 
technology as the sconce that he was born into in his family's house on King Street. There were still dirt roads. The, his father kept three kept pigs, and his brother's chores included milking the family's three cows and helping dories out of the surf onto the beach. But as he, as he grew up, he would begin to start delivering messages, first as a bicycle messenger for the post office, the telegraph office, and the wireless station, with a golden memory of his being when Jack Johnson fought Jim Jeffers, uh, the fight of which was all 15 rounds was broadcast via the wireless, and for which he was engaged to deliver the report of each round to the actor Bob Hilliard after the last round of which he was given a crisp five dollars. Now Philip Morris would go on to further learn the trade of communications in 1918 as he would be in the Boston Radio School before going overseas for the First World War. And then in his time as postmaster, he would remark upon the first flight air mail event in May of 1938, in which 219 pieces of Sconset post would go off to vast locate, vastly far away locations such as Anchorage, Alaska, Hawaii, Sweden, and even Wisconsin. <laughs> and even later in his life, Phil, Mr. Morris would be a pioneer in technology in Sconset as he was known to have one of the village's first televisions. <laughs> now, Mr. Morris would conduct his duties as postmaster very well over the years, uh, despite certain challenges, including uh, early on in, the 19, in 1937, when uh, after going home uh, from the post office, a person saw a fire in the post office at about 6 to 15. Uh, said person uh, soon went to Mrs. Edward Reith, who immediately telephoned Mr. Morris about the situation, and the discoverer would go to pull two of the fire boxes to try and sound the alarm, but no sound w came out, and so he went to telephone the central fire station, and a pump cart was soon sent out. Now, Mr. Morris, hearing the situation, was ready to a tee and went directly to the post office and, through a glance at the window, was able to ascertain that a major conflagration was in process, and so immediately went to the post, moved it to a safe location, and then the fire was soon put out. Uh, also in 1956, uh, Mr. Philip Morris would also be faced with something we all are, a series of just really bad days. <laughs> As uh, in March of that year, he would be awoken in the middle of the night by 70 mile an hour winds and a great crash which would see him roused from his bed without coat and dressed only in his pajamas and slippers to go outside to see what the matter was, at which point the wind promptly blew the door shut behind him and locked it. <laughs> At which point, noticing his state of undress, he realized he could not simply go to one of the neighboring houses to ask for help, and so ascertained the location of a nearby rock and used it to smash in the window so he could climb back in the kitchen. The day after that, he proceeds to burn his bacon in the morning, and then while going out to Pulpus Harbor to try and get shellfish, will proceed to get his truck stuck in the mud up to the, belly, to the running board. Luckily, however, he is able to catch a ride back to Sconset and is able to get the mail to the steamer. But on his return to his truck with the help of young Kenny Coffin, he is able to get it out, but then proceeds to jam his thumb in Kenny's truck. <laughs> and uh, I believe I'm going to hand it back to my mother now. Thank you. <laughs> Snooki, you have a story for us about Philip Morris, and I saw Sheila Todd come in, and her mother was pictured a few slides ago, Lila Folger, who worked for Philip Morris for years. So Snooki, tell us your story, if you would. 
Okay, during the 1950s, the Korean War, our brother and I took turns delivering special delivery mail on bicycles. One afternoon, my brother had one for Walter Barnicky Sr. that was special. He had to sign himself. So the maid took him upstairs. My brother, he'd never seen a TV before, never mind a Red Sox game. <laughs> and he's standing there watching the ball game. Mr. Barnicky says, sit down, boy, sit down. It's the ninth inning. They finished the ball, the game got over. He, Mr. Barnicky calls the maid up, get Andy up here to take him around in the car so he finishes on time. We don't want Phil Morris to know he was watching ball games. <laughs> Thank you, Snooky. Sheila, are you willing to say anything? All right, I will, and did Martha, was Martha Butler able to be here? No. no, okay, then I will tell you what she had to say, that she said Philip Morris used to call me brown eyes, and that she'd get off the school bus from town, high school, and she would make a beeline for the post office to collect a love letter from her high school sweetheart. She refused to divulge names. And then Jerry Eldridge has said that he used to have to bring a note signed by his mother to pick up mail from Philip Morris. So after Philip Morris resigned from the job, there was a period of post office drama, the conclusion of which was reported on the front page of the Inquirer and Mirror on April 25th, 1963. Mrs. Egan is finally sworn in as acting Sconset Postmaster. The appointment of Mrs. Egan brings to an end a problem that has plagued both the Democratic Town Committee and the Democratic State Committee ever since the former postmaster, Philip Morris, retired early in January. And I'm going to try and summarize this because I know the time is marching on. Um, but there was a previous acting postmaster, James H. Walsh. He assumed the position February 8th, got approved by Senator Edward Kennedy, and a short time thereafter informed the post office duty he wished to be relieved of his duties as soon as possible. Then the next person, the next candidate, John W. Morgan, um, before his nomination was approved, withdrew his name when he was made manager of Straight Wharf Auto Service. So Mrs. Egan was the final choice. And um, her son, Dennis, still lives on island and runs the fuel department at Sun Island. Now, Rob, you have a Mary Egan story for us. Well, I think in the interest of time, you should just come tell us your story. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures of Fred Egan, her, her husband. husband. Okay, well, if you're going to put it up there, he wrote in Voices of the Village. Um, and he said, I remember crawling under the post office when it used to freeze up and I'd have to take a blowtorch and thaw out all the pipes. But now they got all kinds of heat in there. They used to have just a little pot belly stove in the middle of the room to keep it warm. Years ago, the mail used to come in at night. Okay, you're on, Rob. So, um, on the left is, uh, the far left is Mike Acklin, who was my good friend, and that was the year we met. And those of you who saw the Codfish Park uh, last year, the Codfish Park show, um, you've seen this picture. But anyway, so there's Mike, and then there's me, and that was the summer we met. I think I was 11, so Mike was 10. And I met him in the post office, and there was just the two of us in there, and how, hi, how are you doing? What are you doing? Where do you live? you know, this and this and talking and stuff. And we were, got to giggling about something and Mary Egan on the right, was looking through the glass of the mailboxes and she said, okay, you guys, settle down out there. And Mike, who was not one to keep his mouth shut, said, yeah, go to hell. <laughs> and back in those days, there was no door into the lobby. 
like there is now. And somehow, Mary Egan got out the back door and around the front and trapped us in the lobby. Grabbed us both by the earlobes and marched us out the door and said, get out of my post office. And that's my Mary Egan story. <laughs> All set. And Mike Acton and I were friends forever after that. So there we go. Thank you, Rob. So Mary Egan served for nine years. Cheryl Lockwood was officer in charge for 1972. Karen Coffin Quigley, who later ran our post office, worked as the summer casual for two summers while she was in college, first during Mary Egan's final summer, and then for the summer Cheryl Lockwood was postmaster. Karen offered some remembrances. For instance, the lobby of the post office spanned the entire front of the building. Everything behind that was back office. There were only two doors, side and front. Both teller windows were used, one for money orders only. Karen reminded me that we were more of a cash society then, and many people used money orders to pay their bills. Or kids working for the summer sent money home to be put in their bank accounts. She also recalled that Mary Egan and Philip Morris lived across the street from each other on King Street. Our next postmaster was Margaret Tierney from 1973 to 1975. I spoke recently with Roberta Reese, who was very sorry not to be able to come tonight. She worked as a Christmas casual for Margaret Tierney, maybe 1974. Roberta remembers that the back of the post office was filled with postmaster Tierney's African violets, which were very old. When Roberta finished her Christmas casual job, Mrs. Tierney gave her a cutting from one of those violets as a gift. Roberta still has that African violet plant almost 50 years later. Wow. Roberta also recalls that Postmaster Tierney's husband had early onset Alzheimer's and that he swept the floor of the post office all day long and greeted people. Roberta said it was a fun job, but hard. Postal historian Steve Kokersberger sent me an article that identified the Syasconsa Post Office as one of the nine Massachusetts post office offices slated for closing as of July 1st, 1975. But instead, in 18, 1983, the office was discontinued as an independent post office and thereafter operated as a branch of the Nantucket Post Office. From 1976 to 1981, Thomas H. Richard was officer in charge. Native born, he served in the US Army for 22 years after graduating from Nantucket High School. Upon release from the Army, Mr. Richard was employed with the US Postal Service and Murray's Package Store. I think about the proximity of the post office to the Sconset Bookstore, and I see a pattern possibly emerging. <laughs> post office work may drive you to drink, Going postal? So, after her Christmas casual job in Sconset, Roberta Reese took the civil service test and went to work as a window clerk at the Nantucket Post Office. But she covered Sconset on Saturdays. At 8 a.m., she'd collect the mail in town and drive it in her own car out to Sconset. She would often not finish till 1.30 or 2. In June of 1980, I think, Thomas Richards yelled at everyone and quit. As Roberta had done the Saturday rotation, she suddenly had to take over and ran the post office for almost a year. That's what she said, Jim. I don't know if that's correct. She said no one had more boyfriends over age 65 than she did, <laughs> all wanting their Wall Street journals. Mr. Bergonier hired her to write out wedding invitations after approving a sample of her handwriting. Seven days after Iski Santos had heart surgery, he was in the post office wearing pants held up by suspenders made of measuring tape. <laughs> Katie Gibbs of Low Beach Road, who was manager of the Chanticleer for a couple of summers, came up to the window one day waving a bunch of mail in front of Roberta's nose. Watch what you're doing. Here is all this mail in the wrong box. After Katie Gibbs left, Roberta went over to the 600s and found that all the Chanticleer mail was in its proper box. No one in that area locked their boxes, so Katie Gibbs had taken out mail from the wrong box. Roberta could never even take a lunch break as people came to the side door to get a stamp or whatever. 
Nonetheless, she concluded, the people in Sconset are the best. Jim Ozias, who is here with us tonight, served from 1981 to 2004. And uh, we'll say our words in a little bit, maybe. Karen Quigley, Quigley took over in 2004 and was moved in 2009. During her tenure, the post office was completely renovated and housed in a trailer during that renovation. April 16, 2009, headline in the Inky, Sconset Post Office, a victim of budget cuts, with summer near hours being reduced to less than four a day. The cutback in hours engendered a write-in campaign directed at the USPS Consumer Affairs Division. It appears that Marianne Felch, I didn't get to ask you about this, Bob, as Civic Association president was heavy invo heavily involved in this effort. The flyer was titled, Saving Sconset's Post Office, and read, just as life returns to Sconset late next month, just as the roses begin to set their buds and the smell of freshly mown lawns permeates the crisp air, mail service to this tiny hamlet on the eastern edge of our island will diminish to a trickle. The US Postal Service has targeted Sconset with its small year-round population as an area where it can trim back service to help meet its projected $100 million shortfall. These hours may be fine for retirees with time on their hands, no jobs to go to, but they are terrible hours for working people who live in Sconset. Imagine being a carpenter and working in town, or even worse, Madiket, and trying to get your mail on your lunch hour. Impossible. Nicole Brown, who moved to Georgia, served after Karen Quigley, and next came Georgia Fowler, who is also with us tonight, who served for around six years. And now we have our delightful Juliana Rose Schultz, who has been with us for three summers. three summers. Oh my gosh, it's been three summers. So I'm going to ask our post office personnel to kindly come. We also have our post office child with us tonight. Would you stand up and just wave, please, my dear? She basically was here during COVID. She didn't have school. So she hung out at the post office during COVID. So we all got to know her and she's grown up beautifully. So if you would kindly come up and we'll, you can say a few words or I'll ask you questions. Jim, do you wanna start? Thank you, Hannah. I've learned more about the post office than I ever knew. <laughs> so have I. What a gal. <laughs> I'm Jim Ozias. I was a uh, postmaster here for 23 years. And uh, I remember my first day I came to the post office, uh, I didn't know anybody. And uh, many of you will remember Iski Santos. He was the first one that greeted me. Uh, and uh, immediately I just felt welcome to Sconset. And uh, I recall that, uh, being in Sconce, it was just like another world uh, to me. It was, just, it was just such a friendly community. Uh, everyone here just made me feel welcome. I, I actually felt like part of your family, and I just so much appreciated that. And uh, I knew Phil Morris, uh, Box 223, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you see, that's, that's the way a postal person thinks. You walk around the street and you see, oh, box 228, oh, box 83, oh, how are you doing, box 418? You know, it's just, just that way. And uh, uh, I, I think because we uh, just had to know everyone and how to get the mail to them because very few people address their mail properly and uh, and the uh, post office at large really didn't want us to deliver that mail if it was improperly addressed, which I just refused to do. And uh, I remember uh, a, a couple of times, right. <laughs> and uh, I recall uh, we had an English gentleman up on the bluff who would call me every day about 11 o'clock and he'd say, Jim, 
what's the form today? Whatever that meant. And I said to him, well, the mail will be in your box by 11.30, just like every other day. <laughs> and uh, I just, uh, it was just so fog permitting, yes. fog permitting. And uh, I just, uh, just have very happy memories of, uh, of working here. And um, I just thank you all for making me feel at home. Thanks so much, Jim. Georgia, would you kindly come up and say a few words? Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all. <laughs> Most of you have seen that Maureen, some of you haven't seen in a while, but it was such an honor and a privilege when Anna reached out to me to come out here. I said, okay, then I get to see all who I didn't get a chance to see. It was such an honor and a privilege to be working at the post office. Uh, I had to resign, reasons beyond my control, but seeing the history of where the post office is coming from, I now understand why all of this, you know, was coming together. But I have, concept has grown on me so much. It's like I'm a part of the family and there's no other place that I'd rather be than in Sconset. It hurt me so much when I had to leave. And even though I'm working somewhere where they treat me very well, it's not Sconset. Aww. Sconset is like a second home to me. And the people here are so warm. Um, I continue to speak so highly of you, to say Sconset is a village to itself, you know? And even though I'm at Marine, I sell Sconset. I encourage people to come here and experience the love and the warmth that is in Sconset. A lot of people don't want to come to the post office to work in Sconset, but they don't know what they're missing out. And I was so honored when the key was handed to me by Nicole, and I was so pleased when I was able to hand it to Juliana and hear so much good things about what she's doing in Sconset. Um, I believe it's God that always send you somebody that takes care of you. COVID was very rough, and I give thanks for my daughter that assisted me a lot, and Bob Felch. <laughs> when I was loaded with packages falling on me, he would send an email out for you all to come and get your packages. But it was such an honor and privilege serving you all. And as long as I'm here, I'll be a part of Sconset family. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgia. Juliana? Yeah, hi. Well, we're, we have time. Come on up here. So, before we start, I will say we do want to thank all of you, those of you that are here and those of you that have come before, for all your service, because truly we could not survive in this village without you. So thank you all. All right, so we have some questions for you. First of all, what could we do to make your life easier? Well, Jim said that nobody addresses their mail properly, which <laughs> it's gotten better, and I know a lot of you have heard me say, please make sure that your P.O. box is somewhere on your packages. It just makes life easier for you guys and the folks working down at the annex. That way, you don't have the pleasure of standing in line down there and I don't have to go chase things around, so that would be helpful. As much as I know about all of you guys, it's nearly impossible to get every single package here. Okay, and what question are you asked most frequently? Do you have any Nantucket stamps? Where's the bluff walk? Where's the bathroom? <laughs> Now, do you happen to have any stories about anyone buying single stamps? <laughs> well, funny you mentioned that, Hannah, because my now boyfriend, who many of you think I'm engaged to already, I'm not. That was an early spoiler by the current. Um, he came in and he asked one of my number one questions, are there any Nantucket stamps? And could I just buy one stamp? 
<laughs> so we know how that ended. Yeah. Is ending. Is this <laughs> off? Did this go off? Yeah, it went off. Oh, maybe the battery's gone. You know what? I think the battery's gone. And we had some history of the, the building, but I'll just tell you briefly that, so stay here for a sec, um, that it was 1875, it was owned by Albert Brock, it was sold to Philip Morris, um, Bill Hunnefield and his wife Jean Nate owned it. They're the ones that sold it to Bernie and Carol, Bernie Coffin's parents, and then it was deeded to Bernie and Carol I want to say maybe 1997, since I'm off my game here. Um, and they yeah, renovated it. 1997. Oh, good, thanks. And they renovated it in 2007. And the only real change they made was they did the ADA accessibility beautifully. And then they added that railing on the roof, which was original. So that was brought back. So with that, I think we're going to wrap it up and thank you all for coming and particularly thank our post office personnel.